Book Talk begins at 3 minutes and 17 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 611, Rikes! This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I just saw the coolest thing. It's been out for a while. I'm probably late to the party, but wow. Stephen Fry, who we love, Stephen Fry is hosting a tour of the Rijksmuseum's Vermeer exhibits. And I am going to have to go dust off some of my old got book images because some of my favorite Vermeers are in there. If you love Stephen Fry's voice, if you love looking at great art, please feel free to follow the link in the show notes for craftlet.com slash 611. Follow the link to the Rijksmuseum in Holland. It's beautiful. They've just done such a lovely job on the the whole setup and everything. It's a feel-good thing to do. So go do that, enjoy that, and let me know what you think. So that's that. That is the entire opening housekeeping and crafty talk for this week, because we have, as promised last week, a really long opening chapter. I am going to break it into two parts. That is because Dumas, when he's kind of channeling his playwrightiness, the action moves along very quickly because it's dialogue. He's really good at very funny dialogue. When he is in his more prosy sections, which would make sense to find at the beginning of a book or the beginning of a chapter where you have some exposition that needs to be done, Uh, When he's in that zone, he's a little bit more ponderous and he's, he really fits a lot of information into very short periods of time. So I wanted to set you up properly for that opening onslaught of exposition because it's, it's all information that people who were reading the book when this was published would have known or at least known well enough to get it. And then once we get through that section, then we'll get on to more of the rollicking good times that we have in store for us. So (laughs) to pull off this, just these first three pages of the book, I had to go back to my conspiracy board, my big drawing board with butcher paper over it so that I could create kind of a It looks like a conspiracy theory board of all of the pieces. The first thing we need to know is a little bit about what was going on after Joan of Arc. So the Hundred Years' War is over, but the problems aren't solved. And so there are wars of religion. And that is, as you might expect, between the Catholics and the Protestants. In this situation, the Protestants are usually, although not always, usually referred to as the Huguenots or Huguenot. They were Calvinist-ish leaning group of Protestants, and they eventually wound up settling in the southern western edge of France, specifically and importantly, eventually coalescing around the town, the port town of La Rochelle. La Rochelle gets mentioned a lot. It is foreshadowing here. It is going to come up later in the book itself. But what you need to understand first is we have a king. (laughs) Funny how that happens. We have a king before our Three Musketeers king. So Daddy King is Henri 
the fourth. He had been Henri the third when he was only king of a smaller portion of France. And when he was the king of that smaller portion of France, he was a Protestant. He was a Huguenot. So when he becomes king of all the France, within four years, he has to go, okay, you know what? It's worth a mass to have a unified country. This is what he said. Eh, I'll convert back to Catholicism. It's worth a mass just to keep y'all happy. So he was pretty popular as a consequence. He does eventually get assassinated at my age, which is a little unnerving. He gets assassinated by a Catholic zealot who was unhappy with his, I guess, <laughs> ability to move so easily between religious convictions. Now, right before Henri IV, there was a Battle of La Rochelle. This was a Protestant Catholic fight. This was part of the religious wars, which D'Artagnan's father will bring up, by the way. So La Rochelle, when, when it's referred to, it was, it was a really bad two-year battle zone within the lifetime of the older people in this book. So Dumas is using it as both a callback to actual history that people would have known about both at the time and when the book was published in 1844, but also giving us a little foreshadowy bit as to what's coming down the road. Now, Henri was interesting. He did have a Protestant wife first. It was annulled, so he did his own little Henry VIII thing, but without chopping people's heads off. So that first marriage, it was a long marriage. It winds up getting annulled, and very shortly thereafter, Henri IV is matched up with Maria de Medici. So this is clearly a political power play. Medici, Catholic, he's already converted. They get married the next year. They have their son, who becomes Louis XIII. Louis XIII is the king who we see all the way throughout the Three Musketeers. Now, Henri IV was called Henri the Good or Henri the Great. Louis is referred to as Louis the Just. I will let you make up your mind as we go through the book. I can't wait to hear your theories about all of that. <laughs> Don't forget, 206-350-1642 if you would like to share your thoughts with everyone. And you can also leave your thoughts at speakpipe.com slash craftlet if you are out of the continental United States or don't want to make a long distance phone call. Okay, so back to our lineage. Louis the Thirteenth was only nine years old when his father was assassinated. So his mother, Maria de' Medici, is put in as regent. And that does not go particularly well. There's a whole mess load of history here that I am not going to get into. It's fascinating, but it's not important for what we're doing now. What is important, however, is that south of La Rochelle is a district, an, an area. I don't even, I don't know if it's considered a commune or not anymore, but it's a region called Gascony. And Gascony used to also incorporate some of the French Basque lands. If you've read the book Shibumi, you may recall Le Cagat, spectacularly effervescent character. In, in fact, in Indiana Jones, the character Salah always reminded me, as played by John Rhys Davies, always reminded me of Le Cagat in his. Um, effusive, big love kind of thing. But the French Basque lands are interesting and they have their own extraordinary history that goes on. What you need to know is this. Henri III grew up in this area. He therefore had an accent that's referred to as a patois, so it's a regional dialect that was never really written down, that 
people in Paris never stopped really making fun of him for. So people from Gascony had some very clear dialectical differences with people in Paris. That's going to come into play. People from Gascony were also, as often happens, looked upon as kind of country bumpkins. You know, they were from out of Paris. They were from, you know, so far away from where all the really cool people are. So there's also that kind of attitude that you're going to see at play. But really, the big joke here is if you recall Cyrano de Bergerac and the kind of, again, big, effusive, funny, larger-than-life character that was Cyrano, not just because of a large nose, Cyrano is a Gascon. And one of the things that Gascons are famous for, evidently, historically, I have no idea if this is still true, was being kind of braggy. They were very, very comfortable at telling everyone just how awesome they were. And so you're going to hear one very particular joke later about D'Artagnan's jaw muscles being quite well cut. Like he has the six-pack abs of jaw muscles, that kind of thing. But that comes later. So we have Gascony. We also have a city called Myon, and it's actually Myon sur Loire. So it's Myon on the river Loire. It's actually where two or three rivers come together. And it's a charming little place. It's about 15 kilometers west of Orléans. So, you know, back to Joan of Arc area. That's the town that we are in when the book begins. It is not the town that we stay in, but it gets referred to several times, especially in the early part of the book. And Dumas is doing a callback here specifically because this is where the author of the medieval romance, capital R romance, courtly romance, capital C, capital R, the romance of the rose. This is where that guy was born. The romance of the rose came up, I think, back uh, 16 years ago, when we did Tristan and Isolde. But you can imagine that Dumas' reasons for bringing it up here are, A, to remind you that Myung is actually kind of an important literary place, so we are starting where literature matters. And also, it's a romance. There's going to be chivalry. There's going to be love. There's going to be passion. There's going to be doing the right things and sometimes doing wrong things to get right outcomes, but always with passion <laughs> and protestations of love and all the other swashbuckly fun stuff. So along with tipping us off that this is going to be a swashbuckly kind of romance, the other thing that Dumas sets us up with is the fact that people are a little skittish. The religious wars have been going on. This is obviously a part of the country that was sucked up into the Hundred Years' War as well. So when it looks like some trouble may be brewing, people are going to get a little panicky. So in this first section, anything that sounds like armor is. I'm not going to get into it. There are lots and lots of names and links, and you can go look up more armor if you want to. It's a lot. The one thing that I thought was interesting is there's a weapon called a partisan, which I don't remember having come across before. It's a long pole weapon. That's all I could find. But that is what a partisan is. It's not grabbing a guy who is a partisan and using him as a weapon. And because Dumas was writing for everyone, he starts off with two tier lists. The first is, if, if the nobles are getting skittish, this is the order in which they will fight people. And so he does like a tier list of 
well, the nobility, if they thought things were going on, was going to fight this person first, then this person, then this person, and down the ranking. One of the things that gets brought up is a war with the king of Spain. This doesn't matter to us right now, except there's a joke that comes up later because the Spanish flag is red and yellow. That's the only thing you need to remember. The second tier list is the common people. If the common people hear that there's trouble a brewing, this is the order of the people that they will fight with, and very importantly, who they will not fight with. All right. So the people are excited by this hubbub. They're not sure what's going on. And in comes D'Artagnan. D'Artagnan is introduced to us initially as a young Don Quixote. So what does this tell us? It tells us he looks ridiculous. That's the main upshot. Just how ridiculous he looks is what Dumas gets into first. And again, anything that sounds like armor. The one thing that I, I can't remember if it's come up before in any previous books, but instead of a scabbard, D'Artagnan is described as carrying his sword in a baldric, which would have been the kind of a leather sash, like a Miss America sash, going across his chest and then down at the side, that's where his sword was hanging off of, which means it would smack him in the leg and it would also be smacking his horse in the thigh, which is not a whole lot of fun, I wouldn't think. Now, the horse's color is described as yellow, but he's also described as a barren pony. Well, barren is where Bernays sauce comes from. So I think this is a joke. I am not entirely sure. Either way, the horse is tired. He's old. He has wind galls, which are like swollen ankles. It's not something that is necessarily painful. It just tells you that the horse is old and has been worked a lot. And his head is going way down as he walks. And there's a comment that it, it's made a martingale quite unnecessary. Now, a martingale is something that you put on, well, some people put on horses if they are doing like barrel riding or jumping. It's to keep the horse's head from going up too high. Because for one thing, you don't want to get smacked in the face by the horse's neck if you're leaning way over the neck of the horse for doing jumps and things. But it's also just another way of controlling the horse's head itself. It isn't necessarily dangerous. If you do it badly, if you do it wrong, it could be dangerous. In this case, it's completely unnecessary because this horse is not lifting its head for anything. So once we get this little description of D'Artagnan and his horse, Dumas is going to give us a flashback to before D'Artagnan entered Myung. And what you're going to hear is a reverse Polonius talk. Polonius's talk in Hamlet is spectacular. His speech to Laertes about neither a borrower nor a lender be, it's all cliched. It's not like it's bad advice. It's just, yeah, 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 dad. I know we've had this conversation 70,000 times. In this situation, it's all the worst advice. Well, it's not all the worst advice. It's a lot of bad advice for for young D'Artagnan and advice that is likely to get him into trouble, as you would expect. One phrase that is used that's kind of uncommon is a balsam that he's going to get a recipe for. And it is a very important recipe for a balsam, a balm or a salve, something that you would put onto wounds or bruises, arnica gel, that kind of thing. That's how this word balsam is being used in this situation. You are also going to hear a reference to a very important and actually real famous character, Monsieur de Treville. His name is spelled T-R-E-V-I-L-L-E. Treville is real. His portrayal is, as far as I can tell so far, accurate. He's a good guy. He was friends with Louis XIII. They were kids together. 
And and there is a line which I don't know if it's supposed to be a joke or not, but I found it very funny. You can listen for it. It's a description of how Trevi and Louis XIII used to play when they were kids and they do play battles. And the king was not always the winner. And the quote is, the blows which he received increased greatly his esteem and friendship for Monsieur de Trevi. <laughs> which I'm like, I don't know. Does that mean he was just, all right, I'm never going to cross you because you the man who can beat me. Or if it was just, you know, respect. I don't know, but it made me smile. There is a phrase, vademecum, V-A-D-E-M-E-C-U-M. This is like a guidebook, like a beta curse, like a, a handbook for life. It's just a phrase that gets used. The phrase agulets, A-I-G-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E-S. These are the little gold braids that some military uniforms have. There's the epaulette that goes over the shoulder and then the little gold braids that hang down from there. That's that's what we're talking about. And then a portmanteau, we've heard this before, is usually a trunk or a large leather suitcase case kind of thing. A poltroon is a coward, and you are going to hear a mysterious stranger as he gallops off on horseback, calling back to his servant, pay him, booby, as a instruction to pay the innkeeper. <laughs> this is probably the one place that we've ever come across a Victorian translation that I actually found funnier than the modern one. The modern one is pay him, rascal. And that's it. Servants don't get treated particularly well in The Three Musketeers. Just, just a heads up. You'll hear a reference to a fable, Aesop's fable of the heron and the snail. I'm going to link out to it. It's pretty obvious, but if you want to read the very short version, you are more than welcome to. You'll hear a phrase, I will spit you all like ortolans. Ortolans are very sweet, adorable little birds that are a delicacy. And so spitting them would be, you know, prepping them to be cooked. So, ew. And there is one last historical figure who gets mentioned, Father Joseph. He was Laminence Gris. He was the gray eminence. He's also referred to as the Cardinals. That would be Cardinal Richelieu. The Cardinals Familiar. Not like a witch's familiar. Well, I guess actually maybe sort of, but a familiar as in confidant and an advisor. So that was who Father Joseph was. And he was actually a Capuchin monk at the time. Phew. Okay. Now. Let's listen to the chapter. This is chapter one of The Three Musketeers, written by Alexandre Dumas and read for us by John Van Stan. Here we go. The Three Presents of D'Artagnan the Elder On the first Monday of the month of April 1625, the market town of Myung, in which the author of Romance of the Rose was born, appeared to be in as perfect a state of revolution as if the Huguenots had just made a second La Rochelle of it. Many citizens, seeing the women flying toward the high street, leaving their children crying at the open doors, hastened to don the cuirass, and supporting their somewhat uncertain courage with a musket or a partisan, directed their steps toward the hostelry of the jolly miller, before which was gathered, increasing every minute, a compact group, vociferous and full of curiosity. In those times, panics were common, and few days passed without some city or other registering in its archives an event of this kind. There were nobles who made war against each other, there was the king who made war against the cardinal, there was Spain which made war against the king. Then, in addition to these concealed or public, secret or open wars, there were robbers, mendicants, Huguenots, wolves, and scoundrels who made war upon everybody. 
The citizens always took up arms readily against thieves, wolves, or scoundrels, often against nobles or Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against the cardinal or Spain. It resulted then from this habit that on the said first Monday of April 1625, the citizens, on hearing the clamor and seeing neither the red and yellow standard nor the livery of the Duc de Richelieu, rushed toward the hostel of the Jolly Miller. When arrived there, the cause of the hubbub was apparent to all. A young man, we can sketch his portrait at a dash. Imagine to yourself a Don Quixote of eighteen, a Don Quixote without his corselet, without his coat of mail, without his cuisses, a Don Quixote clothed in a woolen doublet, the blue color of which had faded into a nameless shade between lees of wine and a heavenly azure, face long and brown, high cheekbones, a sign of sagacity, the maxillary muscles enormously developed, an infallible sign by which a Gascon may always be detected even without his cap and our young man wore a cap set off with a sort of feather, the eye open and intelligent, the nose hooked, but finely chiseled, too big for a youth, too small for a grown man. An experienced eye might have taken him for a farmer's son upon a journey had it not been for the long sword which, dangling from a leather baldric, hit against the calves of its owner as he walked, and against the rough side of his steed when he was on horseback for our young man had a steed which was the observed of all observers. It was a Bayern pony from twelve to fourteen years old, yellow in his hide, without a hair in his tail, but not without wind galls on his legs, which, though going with his head lower than his knees, rendering a martingale quite unnecessary, contrived nevertheless to perform his eight leagues a day. Unfortunately, the qualities of this horse were so well concealed under his strange-colored hide and his unaccountable gait, that at a time when everybody was a connoisseur in horse-flesh, the appearance of the aforesaid pony at Myung, which place he had entered about a quarter of an hour before by the gate of Beaugency, produced an unfavorable feeling, which extended to his rider." and this feeling had been more painfully perceived by young d'artagnan for so was the don quixote of this second rosinante named from his not being able to conceal from himself the ridiculous appearance that such a steed gave him good horseman as he was he had sighed deeply therefore when accepting the gift of the pony from m d'artagnan the elder he was not ignorant that such a beast was worth at least twenty livres, and the words which had accompanied the present were above all price. "'My son,' said the old Gascon gentleman, in that pure Bayan patois of which Henry the Fourth could never rid himself, "'this horse was born in the house of your father about thirteen years ago, and has remained in it ever since.' which ought to make you love it. Never sell it. Allow it to die tranquilly and honorably of old age. And if you make a campaign with it, take as much care of it as you would of an old servant. At court, provided you have ever the honor to go there, continued Monsieur d'Artagnan the elder, in honor to which remember, your ancient nobility gives you the right. Sustain worthily your name of gentleman, which has been worthily borne by your ancestors for five hundred years, both for your own sake and the sake of those who belong to you. By the latter I mean your relatives and friends. Endure nothing from anyone except Monsieur the Cardinal and the King." It is by his courage, please observe, by his courage alone, that a gentleman can make his way nowadays. Whoever hesitates for a second, perhaps allows the bait to escape which, during that exact second, fortune held out to him. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. The first is that you are a Gascon, and the second is that you are my son. 
Never fear quarrels, but seek adventures. I have taught you how to handle a sword. You have thews of iron, a wrist of steel. Fight on all occasions. Fight the more for duels being forbidden, since consequently there is twice as much courage in fighting. I have nothing to give you, my son, but fifteen crowns, my horse, and the counsels you have just heard. Your mother will add to them a recipe for a certain balsam, which she had from a bohemian, and which has the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds that do not reach the heart. Take advantage of all, and live happily and long. I have but one word to add, and that is to propose an example to you. Not mine, for I myself have never appeared at court, and have only taken part in religious wars as a volunteer. I speak of Monsieur de Treville, who was formerly my neighbor, and who had the honor to be, as a child, the playfellow of our king, Louis the Thirteenth, whom God preserve. Sometimes their play degenerated into battles, and in these battles the king was not always the stronger. The blows which he received increased greatly his esteem and friendship for Monsieur de Treville. Afterward, Monsieur de Treville fought with others. In his first journey to Paris, five times, from the death of the late king till the young one came of age, without reckoning wars and sieges, seven times, and from that date up to the present day, a hundred times, perhaps, so that in spite of edicts, ordinances, and decrees, there he is, captain of the musketeers, that is to say, chief of a legion of Caesars, whom the king holds in great esteem, and whom the cardinal dreads, he who dreads nothing, as it is said. Still further, Monsieur de Treville gains ten thousand crowns a year. He is therefore a great noble. He began as you begin. Go to him with this letter, and make him your model, in order that you may do as he has done. Upon which Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder girded his own sword round his son, kissed him tenderly on both cheeks, and gave him his benediction. On leaving the paternal chamber, the young man found his mother, who was waiting for him, with the famous recipe of which the counsels we have just repeated would necessitate frequent employment. The adieux are on this side longer and more tender than they had been on the other. Not that Monsieur d'Artagnan did not love his son, who was his only offspring, but Monsieur d'Artagnan was a man, and he would have considered it unworthy of a man to give way to his feelings, whereas Madame d'Artagnan was a woman, and still more, a mother. She wept abundantly, and let us speak it to the praise of Monsieur d'Artagnan the younger, notwithstanding the efforts he made to remain firm, as a future musketeer ought, Nature prevailed, and he shed many tears, of which he succeeded with great difficulty in concealing the half. The same day the young man set forward on his journey, furnished with the three paternal gifts, which consisted, as we have said, of fifteen crowns, the horse, and the letter for Monsieur de Treville, the counsels being thrown into the bargain. With such a vare mecum, d'Artagnan was morally and physically an exact copy of the hero of Cervantes to whom we so happily compared him when our duty of an historian placed us under the necessity of sketching his portrait. Don Quixote took windmills for giants and sheep for armies. D'Artagnan took every smile for an insult and every look as a provocation. Whence it resulted that from Tarbes to Meung his fist was constantly doubled, or his hand on the hilt of his sword— and yet the fist did not descend upon any jaw, nor did the sword issue from its scabbard. It was not that the sight of the wretched pony did not excite numerous smiles on the countenances of passers-by, but 
as against the side of this pony rattled a sword of respectable length, and as over this sword gleamed an eye rather ferocious than haughty, these passers-by repressed their hilarity, or, if hilarity prevailed over prudence, they endeavored to laugh only on one side, like the masks of the ancients. D'Artagnan then remained majestic and intact in his susceptibility, till he came to this unlucky city of Meung. But there, as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the jolly miller, without any one, host, waiter, or hostler, coming to hold his stirrup or take his horse, D'Artagnan spied, through an open window on the ground floor, a gentleman, well made and of good carriage, although of rather a stern countenance, talking with two persons who appeared to listen to him with respect. D'Artagnan fancied quite naturally, according to his custom, that he must be the object of their conversation, and listened. This time D'Artagnan was only in part mistaken. He himself was not in question, but his horse was. The gentleman appeared to be enumerating all his qualities to his auditors, and, as I have said, the auditors seeming to have great deference for the narrator, they every moment burst into fits of laughter. Now, as a half-smile was sufficient to awaken the irascibility of the young man, the effect produced upon him by this vociferous mirth may be easily imagined. Nevertheless, D'Artagnan was desirous of examining the appearance of this impertinent personage who ridiculed him. He fixed his haughty eye upon the stranger, and perceived a man of from forty to forty-five years of age, with black and piercing eyes, pale complexion, a strongly marked nose, and a black and well-shaped mustache. He was dressed in a doublet and hose of a violet color, with aguilettes of the same color, without any other ornaments than the customary slashes, through which the shirt appeared. This doublet and hose, though new, were creased, like traveling clothes for a long time packed in a portmanteau. D'Artagnan made all these remarks with the rapidity of a most minute observer, and doubtless from an instinctive feeling that this stranger was destined to have a great influence over his future life. Now, as at the moment in which D'Artagnan fixed his eyes upon the gentleman in the violet doublet, the gentleman made one of his most knowing and profound remarks respecting the Bernese pony, his two auditors laughed even louder than before, and he himself, though contrary to his custom, allowed a pale smile, if I may be allowed to use such an expression, to stray over his countenance. This time there could be no doubt. D'Artagnan was really insulted. Full, then, of this conviction, he pulled his cap down over his eyes, and, endeavoring to copy some of the court airs he had picked up in Gascony among young traveling nobles, he advanced with one hand on the hilt of his sword and the other resting on his hip. Unfortunately, as he advanced, his anger increased at every step, and instead of the proper and lofty speech he had prepared as a prelude to his challenge, he found nothing at the tip of his tongue but a gross personality which he accompanied with a furious gesture. "'I say, sir, you, sir, who are hiding yourself behind that shutter, yes, you, sir, tell me what you are laughing at, and we will laugh together.' The gentleman raised his eyes slowly from the nag to his cavalier, as if he required some time to ascertain whether it could be to him that such strange reproaches were addressed. Then, when he could not possibly entertain any doubt of the matter— his eyebrows slightly bent, and with an accent of irony and insolence impossible to be described, he replied to D'Artagnan, "'I was not speaking to you, sir.' "'But I am speaking to you,' replied the young man, additionally exasperated with this mixture of insolence and good manners, of politeness and scorn. The stranger looked at him again with a slight smile, and retiring from the window came out of the hostelry with a slow step, and placed himself before the horse within two paces of D'Artagnan. His quiet manner and the ironical expression of his countenance redoubled the mirth of the persons with whom he had been talking, and who still remained at the window. 
D'Artagnan, seeing him approach, drew his sword a foot out of the scabbard. "'This horse is decidedly, or rather has been in his youth, a buttercup,' resumed the stranger, continuing the remarks he had begun, and addressing himself to his auditors at the window without paying the least attention to the exasperation of D'Artagnan, who, however, placed himself between him and them. "'It is a color very well known in botany, but till the present time very rare among horses.' "'There are people who laugh at the horse that would not dare to laugh at the master,' cried the young emulator of the furious Treville. "'I do not often laugh, sir,' replied the stranger, "'as you may perceive by the expression of my countenance, "'but, nevertheless, I retain the privilege of laughing when I please.' "'And I,' cried D'Artagnan, "'will allow no man to laugh when it displeases me.' "'Indeed, sir,' continued the stranger, "'more calm than ever. "'Well,' That is perfectly right. And turning on his heel, was about to re-enter the hostelry by the front gate, beneath which D'Artagnan, on arriving, had observed a saddled horse. But D'Artagnan was not of a character to allow a man to escape him thus, who had the insolence to ridicule him. He drew his sword entirely from the scabbard, and followed him, crying, "'Turn! Turn, Master Joker, lest I strike you from behind!' "'Strike me?' said the other, turning on his heels and surveying the young man with as much astonishment as contempt. "'Why, my good fellow, you must be mad!' Then, in a suppressed tone, as if speaking to himself, "'This is annoying,' continued he. "'What a godsend this would be for his majesty!' who is seeking everywhere for brave fellows to recruit for his musketeers. He had scarcely finished when D'Artagnan made such a furious lunge at him that if he had not sprung nimbly backward, it is probable he would have jested for the last time. The stranger then, perceiving that the matter went beyond raillery, drew his sword, saluted his adversary, and seriously placed himself on guard. But at the same moment his two auditors, accompanied by the host, fell upon D'Artagnan with sticks, shovels, and tongs. This caused so rapid and complete a diversion from the attack that D'Artagnan's adversary, while the latter turned round to face this shower of blows, sheathed his sword with the same precision, and instead of an actor, which he had nearly been, became a spectator of the fight a part in which he acquitted himself with his usual impassiveness, muttering, nevertheless, "'A plague upon these Gascons! Replace him on his orange horse, and let him be gone!' "'Not before I have killed you, poltroon!' cried D'Artagnan, making the best face possible, and never retreating one step before his three assailants, who continued to shower blows upon him. "'Another Gasconade!' murmured the gentleman, "'By my honor, these Gascons are incorrigible. "'Keep up the dance, then, since he will have it so. "'When he is tired, he will perhaps tell us that he has had enough of it.' "'But the stranger knew not the headstrong personage he had to do with. "'D'Artagnan was not the man ever to cry for quarter. "'The fight was therefore prolonged for some seconds, "'but at length D'Artagnan dropped his sword, "'which was broken in two pieces by the blow of a stick.' Another blow, full upon his forehead, at the same moment brought him to the ground, covered with blood and almost fainting. It was at this moment that people came flocking to the scene of action from all sides. The host, fearful of consequences with the help of his servants, carried the wounded man into the kitchen, where some trifling attentions were bestowed upon him. As to the gentleman... He resumed his place at the window and surveyed the crowd with a certain impatience, evidently annoyed by their remaining undispersed. "'Well, how is it with this madman?' exclaimed he, turning round as the noise of the door announced the entrance of the host, who came in to inquire if he was unhurt. "'Your Excellency is safe and sound?' asked the host. "'Oh, yes.' "'Perfectly safe and sound, my good host, 
and I wish to know what has become of our young man. He is better, said the host. He fainted quite away. Indeed, said the gentleman. But before he fainted, he collected all his strength to challenge you and to defy you while challenging you. Why, this fellow must be the devil in person, cried the stranger. Uh, no, your excellency, he is not the devil, replied the host with a grin of contempt, for during his fainting we rummaged his valise and found nothing but a clean shirt and eleven crowns, which, however, did not prevent his saying, as he was fainting, that if such a thing had happened in Paris, you should have cause to repent of it at a later period. Then, said the stranger coolly, he must be some prince in disguise. I have told you this, good sir, resumed the host, in order that you may be on your guard. Did he name no one in his passion? Yes, he struck his pocket and said, We shall see what Monsieur de Treville will think of this insult offered to his protégé. Monsieur de Treville? said the stranger, becoming attentive. He put his hand upon his pocket while pronouncing the name of Monsieur de Treville. Now, my dear host, while your young man was insensible, you did not fail, I am quite sure, to ascertain what that pocket contained. What was there in it? A letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the musketeers. Indeed. Exactly as I have the honor to tell your excellency. The host, who was not endowed with great perspicacity, did not observe the expression with which his words had given to the physiognomy of the stranger. The latter rose from the front of the window, upon the sill of which he had leaned with his elbow, and knitted his brow like a man disquieted. The devil, murmured he between his teeth, can Treville have set this Gascon upon me? He is very young, but a sword thrust is a sword thrust, whatever be the age of him who gives it, and a youth is less to be suspected than an older man. And the stranger fell into a reverie which lasted some minutes. A weak obstacle is sometimes sufficient to overthrow a great design. Host, said he. Could you not contrive to get rid of this frantic boy for me? In conscience I cannot kill him. And yet, added he with a coldly menacing expression, he annoys me. Where is he? In my wife's chamber, on the first flight, where they are dressing his wounds. His things and his bag are with him. Has he taken off his doublet? On the contrary, everything is in the kitchen. But if he annoys you, this young fool... To be sure he does. He causes a disturbance in your hostelry, which respectable people cannot put up with. Go, make out my bill and notify my servant. What, monsieur, will you leave us so soon? You know that very well as I gave my order to saddle my horse. Have they not obeyed me? It is done as your excellency may have observed. Your horse is in the great gateway, ready saddled for your departure. That is well. Do as I have directed you then. What the devil? said the host to himself. Can he be afraid of this boy? But an imperious glance from the stranger stopped him short. He bowed humbly and retired. It is not necessary for Milady to be seen by this fellow, continued the stranger. She will soon pass. She is already late. I had better get on horseback and go and meet her. I should like, however, to know what this letter addressed to Treville contains. We are well aware that this term, Milady is only properly used when followed by a family name, but we find it thus in the manuscript 
and we do not choose to take upon ourselves to alter it. And the stranger, muttering to himself, directed his steps toward the kitchen. In the meantime, the host, who entertained no doubt that it was the presence of the young man that drove the stranger from his hostelry, reascended to his wife's chamber, and found D'Artagnan just recovering his senses, giving him to understand that the police would deal with him pretty severely for having sought a quarrel with a great lord, for in the opinion of the host the stranger could be nothing less than a great lord, he insisted that notwithstanding his weakness, D'Artagnan should get up and depart as quickly as possible. D'Artagnan, half stupefied, without his doublet and with his head bound up in a linen cloth, arose then and urged by the host, began to descend the stairs. But on arriving at the kitchen, the first thing he saw was his antagonist, talking calmly at the step of a heavy carriage, drawn by two large Norman horses. His interlocutor, whose head appeared through the carriage window, was a woman of from twenty to two and twenty years. We have already observed with what rapidity D'Artagnan sees the expression of a countenance. He perceived then at a glance that this woman was young and beautiful, and her style of beauty struck him more forcibly from its being totally different from that of the southern countries in which D'Artagnan had hitherto resided. She was pale and fair, with long curls falling in profusion over her shoulders, had large, blue, languishing eyes, rosy lips, and hands of alabaster. She was talking with great animation with the stranger. "'His eminence then orders me,' said the lady, "'to return instantly to England, and to inform him as soon as the Duke leaves London.' "'And as to my other instructions?' asked the fair traveller. "'They are contained in this box, which you will not open until you are on the other side of the channel.' "'Very well. And you? What will you do?' "'I? I return to Paris.' "'What? Without chastising this insolent boy?' asked the lady. The stranger was about to reply, but— at the moment he opened his mouth, D'Artagnan, who had heard all, precipitated himself over the threshold of the door. "'This insolent boy chastises others,' cried he, "'and I hope that this time he whom he ought to chastise will not escape him as before.' "'Will not escape him?' replied the stranger, knitting his brow. "'No, before a woman you would dare not fly, I presume?' "'Remember,' said Milady, seeing the stranger lay his hand on his sword, "'the least delay may ruin everything.' "'You are right,' cried the gentleman. "'Be gone, then, on your part, and I will depart as quickly on mine.' And bowing to the lady, he sprang into his saddle, while her coachman applied his whip vigorously to his horses. The two interlocutors thus separated, taking opposite directions at full gallop, "'Pay him, booby!' cried the stranger to his servant, without checking the speed of his horse, and the man, after throwing two or three silver pieces at the foot of mine host, galloped after his master. "'Base coward! False gentleman!' cried D'Artagnan, springing forward in his turn after the servant. But his wound had rendered him too weak to support such an exertion. Scarcely had he gone ten steps, when his ears began to tingle— a faintness seized him, a cloud of blood passed over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying still, "'Coward! Coward! Coward!' "'He is a coward indeed,' grumbled the host, drawing near to D'Artagnan, and endeavoring by this little flattery to make up matters with the young man, as the heron of the fable did with the snail he had despised the evening before. "'Yes, a very base coward!' murmured D'Artagnan. But she, she was very beautiful. What she? demanded the host. Milady, faltered D'Artagnan and fainted a second time. Ah, it's all one, said the host. I have lost two customers, but this one remains, of whom I am pretty certain for some days to come. There will be eleven crowns gained. 
It is to be remembered that eleven crowns was just the sum that remained in D'Artagnan's purse. The host had reckoned upon eleven days of confinement at a crown a day, but he had reckoned without his guest. On the following morning at five o'clock, D'Artagnan arose, and descending to the kitchen without help, asked among other ingredients the list of which has not come down to us, for some oil, some wine, and some rosemary, and with his mother's recipe in his hand, composed a balsam, with which he anointed his numerous wounds, replacing his bandages himself, and positively refusing the assistance of any doctor. D'Artagnan walked about that same evening, and was almost cured by the morrow. But when the time came to pay for his rosemary, this oil, and the wine, the only expense the master had incurred, as he had preserved a strict abstinence, while on the contrary the yellow horse, by the account of the hostler at least, had eaten three times as much as a horse of his size could reasonably be supposed to have done, D'Artagnan found nothing in his pocket but his little old velvet purse with the eleven crowns it contained, for as to the letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, it had disappeared. The young man commenced his search for the letter with the greatest patience, turning out his pockets of all kinds over and over again, rummaging and re-rummaging in his valise, and opening and reopening his purse, but when he found that he had come to the conviction that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time into such a rage as was near costing him a fresh consumption of wine, oil, and rosemary, for upon seeing this hot-headed youth become exasperated and threatened to destroy everything in the establishment if his letter were not found, the host seized a spit, his wife a broom-handle, and the servants the same sticks they had used the day before. "'My letter of recommendation!' cried D'Artagnan. "'My letter of recommendation, or the holy blood! I will spit you all like ordolins!' Unfortunately, there was one circumstance which created a powerful obstacle to the accomplishment of this threat, which was, as we have related, that his sword had been in this first conflict broken in two, and which he had entirely forgotten. Hence it resulted, when D'Artagnan proceeded to draw his sword in earnest, he found himself purely and simply armed with a stump of a sword about eight or ten inches in length, which the host had carefully placed in the scabbard. As to the rest of the blade, the master had slyly put that on one side to make himself a larding pin. But this deception would probably not have stopped our fiery young man if the host had not reflected that the reclamation which his guest made was perfectly just. "'But after all,' said he, lowering the point of his spit, "'where is this letter?' "'Yes, where is this letter?' cried D'Artagnan. "'In the first place, I warn you, that that letter is for Monsieur de Treville, and it must be found, or if it is not found, he will know how to find it.' His threat completed the intimidation of the host. After the king and the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville was the man whose name was perhaps most frequently repeated by the military and even by citizens.' There was, to be sure, Father Joseph, but his name was never pronounced but with a subdued voice, such was the terror inspired by his gray eminence, as the cardinal's familiar was called. Throwing down his spit and ordering his wife to do the same with her broom-handle, and the servants with their sticks, he set the first example of commencing an earnest search for the lost letter. "'Does the letter contain anything valuable?' demanded the host, after a few minutes of useless investigation. "'Zounds! I think it does indeed!' cried the Gascon, who reckoned upon this letter for making his way at court. "'It contained my fortune!' "'Bills upon Spain?' asked the disturbed host. "'Bills upon His Majesty's private treasury,' answered D'Artagnan, who, reckoning upon entering into the king's service in consequence of this recommendation, believed he could make this somewhat hazardous reply without telling of a falsehood. "'The devil!' cried the host, at his wit's end. "'But it's of no importance,' continued D'Artagnan with natural assurance. "'It's of, it's of no importance. The money is nothing.' 
That letter was everything. I would rather have lost the thousand pistoles than have lost it. He would not have risked more if he had said twenty thousand, but a certain juvenile modesty restrained him. A ray of light all at once broke upon the mind of the host, as he was giving himself to the devil upon finding nothing. "'That letter is not lost!' cried he. "'What?' cried D'Artagnan. "'No, it has been stolen from you!' "'Stolen? By whom?' "'By the gentleman who was here yesterday. He came down into the kitchen, where your doublet was. He remained there some time alone. I would lay a wager he has stolen it.' "'Do you think so?' answered D'Artagnan but little convinced, as he knew better than anyone else, how entirely personal the value of this letter was, and saw nothing in it likely to tempt cupidity. The fact was that none of his servants, none of the travelers present, could have gained anything by being possessed of this paper. "'Do you say,' resumed D'Artagnan, "'that you suspect that impertinent gentleman?' "'I tell you, I am sure of it.' continued the host. When I informed him that your lordship was the protégé of Monsieur de Treville, and that you even had a letter for that illustrious gentleman, he appeared to be very much disturbed, and asked me where that letter was, and immediately came down into the kitchen, where he knew your doublet was. "'Then that's my thief,' replied D'Artagnan. I will complain to Monsieur de Treville, and Monsieur de Treville will complain to the king. He then drew two crowns majestically from his purse, and gave them to the host who accompanied him cap in hand to the gate, and remounted his yellow horse which bore him without any further accident to the gate of St. Antoine at Paris, where his owner sold him for three crowns, which was a very good price considering that D'Artagnan had ridden him hard during the last stage. Thus, the dealer to whom D'Artagnan sold him for the nine livres did not conceal from the young man that he only gave that enormous sum for him on the account of the originality of his color. Thus, D'Artagnan entered Paris on foot, carrying his little packet under his arm, and walked about till he found an apartment to be let on terms suited to the scantiness of his means. This chamber was a sort of garret, situated in the Rue des Fossoyeurs near the Luxembourg. As soon as the earnest money was paid, D'Artagnan took possession of his lodging and passed the remainder of the day in sewing onto his doublet and hose some ornamental braiding, which his mother had taken off an almost new doublet of the elder Monsieur D'Artagnan, and which she had given her son secretly. Next he went to the Quai de Feraille to have a new blade put to his sword, and then returned toward the Louvre, inquiring of the first musketeer he met for the situation of the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, which proved to be in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, that is to say, in the immediate vicinity of the chamber hired by D'Artagnan, a circumstance which appeared to furnish a happy augury for the success of his journey. After this, satisfied with the way in which he had conducted himself at Meung, without remorse for the past, confident in the present, and full of hope for the future, he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the brave. This sleep, provincial as it was, brought him to nine o'clock in the morning, at which hour he rose in order to repair to the residence of Monsieur de Treville, the third personage in the kingdom in the paternal estimation. End of chapter one. All right. Whew, we made it. Okay, takeaways. Milady. Did you hear that subtext? There was a footnote telling us that, yes, 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 Dumas knows that Milady is supposed to be followed by her last name. And that's fine and all, but right now, she is only being referred to as Milady. So, nice and suspenseful. Yay! We know she was pretty. She is rich looking. Alabaster skin, all the everything that you should have in a woman in a book like this. She is heading off by herself across the English Channel with a box that is holding instructions from his eminence. That would be 
the cardinal. Wah, wah, wah. I don't know about you, but I loved the image of D'Artagnan yanking his broken sword out of out of the baldric and going like, what? Well, huh. And it turns out that the <laughs> the tavern owner said that he, he kept the other half of the blade aside because he was going to turn it into a larding pin. So it wasn't important beforehand, but a larding pin, and I've I have linked out to information on this. It's a various different forms. Think of like a a larger than average turkey basting needle, the kind of needle that you could inject liquid into meat with, and instead think of using it to push in lardons, strips of lard into the meat. You can imagine it would make it very juicy. It's just kind of, I guess if you're not really used to it, kind of gross. But that is what he was in fact talking about. I'm sure you noticed that D'Artagnan, having listened faithfully to his father's advice, took none of it except for the importance of the letter to Monsieur de Treville. And yet he did take all of his mother's advice and made that balsam and got himself all healthy and better and well, and then utterly failed. But he has made it to Paris. He is living near the Luxembourg Palace, which was built for Maria de' Medici. It is now, I think it's where the French Senate meets. I have a link out to their website, so you can take a look. It's beautiful. But it does mean that D'Artagnan landed into a part of Paris that was not particularly dangerous. All right, book talk done. A little bit of other housekeeping. We have a raffle. We have a raffle winner. We'll have another raffle next month. Um, I've got a lot of books that were shipped to me as part of publishing deals. So they, they have been in boxes, a lot of knitting pattern books. So I'm really excited that Eric and Jemuel can help me raffle those off so I can get them into your hands now instead of in a box here with me. So we will be doing more raffles as we go through uh, through the Three Musketeers. But first, prrr, drum roll, we have a winner, Heather. Heather M. F. Not Heather H. O. Because that would be ridiculous if I gave it to myself. But Heather, you are the winner. I have emailed you. Please get in touch with us. Let me know your address, your mailing address, and I will pop this sucker into the mail to you. Um, I probably won't do it the day that you're listening to this, because it's my birthday. But this weekend, I should be able to get to the post office and get this puppy out to you, this ginormous tome. I'm so excited that somebody else gets to look at this glorious piece of scholarship along with me. So yay. And a hun- and another Heather, even better. We also wanted to thank the new patrons who have shown up um, a couple people back in February, but uh, most everybody who I'm going to read the names of has signed up in just the last week. That would be Jennifer J, Jill S, Amy O, Louisa S, Louis G, Wendy P, Rachel M, Elnora R, Amy L, Martha D, Sharon L, and Rebecca S. I just saw your pledge come in now, so you will know (laughs) when I'm recording this. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you all so much. This means the world to me. And thank you, too, to the people who... um, who did the raffle copter raffle and sent messages to us. So we knew where things were going wonky, where things might need some tweakage. Super, super helpful, especially now that I have Eric and Jemuel here to help out. I hope you guys are starting to interact with them too. They are, they are just lovely. We also wanted to announce on the Patreon front that we've updated the Patreon tiers. So this set of updates just went out 
was it yesterday? Day before yesterday. So Tuesday, May 2nd. So you may find that you're getting Patreon perks that you weren't getting before. The things that haven't changed, uh, there's still access to premium audio. There will be premium audio coming out again. It won't be as regular as it was when we had kind of the just the books feed, uh, but it it will be happening again. And, uh, and that premium audio will be available on the app if you sign up for premium audio there or at the $5 level on Patreon. So that hasn't changed at all. One of the things that is new is we have started a Discord server. Now, if you're not on Discord and you have no interest in being anywhere else online, I get it. Don't worry about it. You'll still be able to get information from the Craftlet uh, email newsletter, which you can sign up for in the show notes for this episode, or just via the regular podcast or Facebook, things like that. If, however, You are interested in joining us on Discord where you can have a safe space for conversating about all the books. This is one of the ways we're trying to solve a a problem that we've had with Craftlet for a while now. Since the show's been going on for so long, it's really hard for people to locate conversations about the books, specific books, because not everybody's listening in real time. And so it means that people who've just started listening are kind of left out. They can't call in with voicemails because those episodes are done. So this is a way for us to give all of our patrons over at Patreon access to a a way that you can talk to each other and also talk to Eric and Jemuel and me with questions or comments or just funny things that you have found online relating to the books that we all love. That also gives you an opportunity to ask of each other, do you remember when Heather mentioned this thing during Tale of Two Cities? Someone will remember. I probably won't because I'm working on Three Musketeers right now, but someone will remember and be able to help. So that's part of the reason for the Discord server. Uh, Once you join, you will see there is a a little readme set of rules, behavior rules. This is not news. It's what everybody who's moderating online spaces has to do now. But we don't anticipate there will be any problems because you're all craftlet people. And this just hasn't been an issue for us. We are an awfully well-behaved bunch. So Discord was very exciting, but even more exciting than that. For the next tier level up on Patreon, we will be hosting a book club night. It'll be the last Thursday of every even month. So the first one we're going to do is going to be the end of June. That'll be June 29th. Uh, For that first one, I am going to pick the book, and that book is The Woman in the Library which will make everybody who shows up on the Zoom calls Thursday nights laugh, I think. Uh, The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentle. You have plenty of time to read it. We will, after this first one in June, uh, we'll be polling all y'all. So anybody who's at that tier level, you'll have a say in what book we're all going to read for the next time. And then, and then we'll be have a chance to read it. And then we'll be able to talk about it together. So these will always be modern books because they're modern and I never get to talk to you guys about modern books. The first one I'm planning on having at 8 p.m. the last Thursday in June, like I said, June 29th. If 8 p.m. turns out to be a lousy time for the majority of the people, I will switch it up. Uh, I'm just trying to think of time zones and everything. And if we have enough international patrons that I need to do this twice at different times of the day, then that's what we'll do. Uh, but for now, that's that's when it's going to happen uh, until further notice. The other exciting thing is every odd month, I'm going to host a movie night, a watch party night, and that will be the last Thursday of every odd month. So the first one will be May. It'll be May 25th. Again, 8 p.m. I haven't announced what the movie will be yet, 
but I am going to pick this movie for this month. And then after that, again, just like with the books, we'll be polling y'all and we will collaboratively choose what movies you want to share watch with me and the other patrons who are pledging at that level. And the one thing that hasn't changed is that uh, whatever was offered to the tier before, the the tier lower, uh, people at the next tier up, you get all of that stuff plus this next extra thing. And then for people who are pledging at the highest level, I've had to limit the number of people that I can do this for. But at the highest level, you are going to start receiving from me a handmade postcard every month. Sometimes it will be a watercolor or a sketch. Sometimes it will be collage or mixed media. Who knows what is going to move me during the month? Either way, you're going to get a a handmade postcard from me to you every month as a way to thank you for your pledge. I also wanted to thank everybody who went over to YouTube and subscribed. We have a little ways yet to go before we can do live streams again. So please encourage friends, family members, people who don't listen. It doesn't matter. Just ask them to subscribe to the YouTube channel for CraftLit. And that is, again, youtube.com slash at the at sign CraftLit dash channel. And that'll get us back up where we used to be so that we can do more fun stuff for you. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed our first chapter of The Three Musketeers, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. A big thanks to all the CraftLit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. 